All right. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining the March edition of a webinar I've started just this year. So this is a fairly fresh thing for me, but really looking at all angles of communication and, and leading and driving this movement, uh, both within Wisconsin and nationally, uh, it's very important that we all are very uh, networked well and close together and that we all communicate kind of in, a, in an extra fashion because we're uh, up against some not really directly, uh, but we're up against some powerful entities. And so as you've known the, the notion of don't feed the beast, um, I always like to clarify, I didn't title the book, Fight the Beast, not interested in the fight necessarily. We are interested in a free market, an open free market, where uh, patients and consumers and employers of healthcare have good options, which is how we shop for everything else. It's how an employer manages everything else, but uh, for some odd reasons, healthcare has been off the radar. So today joining us is uh, Terry Shook, is someone I've known for over a year now, and he comes from, uh, I'm not sure originally, but at least uh, now Northern Illinois, which I know fairly well. I had actually graduated, uh, spent a lot of time in my childhood in Iowa on a farm, but also some time in Freeport, Illinois, if you know Freeport, and we were the, uh, our mascot was the pretzels. So pretty intimidating, I know, to, to play the pretzels, but we were we, we had fun and we were good. Uh, so today's episode, I think, is going to be a really fascinating discussion uh, because Terry has a background that I think, uh, once we get into this, you'll see if you don't know Terry, it's just very interesting. I think we can learn about the inner workings of the bukas, which we talk about a lot, right, which are the market share leaders. And what's interesting, and, and I'll make a point here and we'll jump in, is that it, um, this notion of, I watched a podcast recently and the, 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 and the host was an MD and he said, what we're seeing in this, this trend in America is rigging institutions of trust. And what I mean by that, and what he means by that, is that uh, institutions that used to be trustworthy, institutions that used to have credibility, institutions that have the, the name and the logo, and often we maybe uh, mistakenly still give them that same trust that they earned 20 or 30 years ago. If we start looking at things, how their behaviors are today, uh, perhaps it causes us to question. I'm going to leave that up to everyone on this call and everyone across the nation. Uh, we can just talk about some things, some experiences that are happening, and you make the call of whether we're talking about trustworthy partners. But I think it's really critical for employers to have trustworthy partners, which sounds kind of almost dumb to say. We would never have untrustworthy partners on our team or anywhere else. Uh, but we've got to be able to know and trust and know that the motives of those we're working with are are the same as ours, that we're aligned. Uh, so welcome, Terry. Terry joins us from Arizona this morning, and I'll turn it over to you to share a little bit about your background and yourself. Okay, well, um, first of all, uh, thank you, Matt, for having me on this morning. I want to shout out to uh, my good friend Harlan Pickett, who I see is on as well. Um, and I'm going to apologize for two quick things. Uh, because I am not in my office uh, in Illinois, uh, Matt and I discovered that I'm, I'm having uh, potential uh, com computer connection problems. So if I fade out, we'll try to uh, get me back as quickly as possible. Uh, the other thing I want to apologize for is I am suffering from allergies going on seven months. So if I go into a sneezing or coughing attack, I'm going to apologize up front for that. Uh, so this morning, I wanted to, to share some of my experience as a executive with a large health carrier, both uh, things I participated in directly and things uh, that I knew the company practiced. And they were part of their business model, which is essentially the same business model for all of the bukas, and that is that they use undisclosed strategies and tactics that were meant purely for the benefit of the carrier at the employer expense. Uh, so the things that, that, that I'm going to share, for the most part, are related to my company, uh, but they are common amongst other carriers as well. Uh, and that is they all share that same business model and are focused on maximizing revenue at the expense of employers. I'm going to give you some examples of that. So what I hope you take away from this discussion is that if you're an employer or, or a broker uh, 
who's selling uh, a, a carrier health plan, uh, you have to understand that your employer lacks the transparency to have any impact on em employee health care costs. Um, I'm reminded a couple months ago, Mark Cuban was quoted as saying, those who are taking your company's money are advantaged when you are confused. So hopefully what I share with you this morning will help you be a little less disadvantaged. It sounds great. So I know we're all anxious to jump in. And just before we do that, Terry, could you give a little bit of background in terms of just how you got to where you are? Now I've mentioned you were a Buka executive Okay. And we'll dig, we'll dig into that detail, but there's a really interesting kind of almost a personal story that goes with that. I think it's important for everybody to know. Okay. Um, first of all, I'm in my 44th year in employee benefits. Um, from being uh, an agency owner to being uh, on two occasions an employee of a carrier. Uh, my first uh, experience with carrier with the carrier industry side of things uh, was I, I was part of a startup team to create a health insurance company for a major health system in, in our Northern Illinois, Southern Wisconsin marketplace. Uh, from there, uh, I spent eight years after we stood the company up and I spent eight years in uh, management with that company and they eventually sold to United. Um, you know, that was back in the 80s where all health systems decided that they all need their own insurance company. Um, ours was not very different from the majority of them where their motivation and uh, their, their wisdom was that they had their own insurance company, they could fill beds. Um, what they didn't account for is the fact that if you have an insurance company, you also have to have a underwriting profit. And while they filled their beds uh, in eight years, there was only one month that they actually achieved an underwriting profit. Uh, so they were uh, they were not uh, like all almost all of the other health uh, systems that had carriers. They were not uh, a permanent uh, fixture in the industry. Uh, so I spent, uh, after that, I spent 20 years uh, with a Blue Cross plan. Um, my, more than half of that time, my position was as a regional market leader, where uh, I was responsible and accountable for all new employer sales, uh, all renewals, and all, uh, all customer service and account management. Um, <clears throat> At the end of that period of time, um, and it got to the point where uh, I decided I, I would retire, I would leave the business and uh, do something else or do nothing else. One of the things I found was that apparently it's not in my DNA to retire, but more importantly, uh, that time away, uh, I, I spent a lot of time in reflection and uh, a, a lot of, of just reflection on uh, how the carrier operated as a business um, and the things that they did to their to their clients. And uh, I started uh, thinking personally about, um, I, I was very well aware of how I created financial disadvantages for the customer. And it began to bother me that I probably um, and I, I don't have it, uh, any real example of this, but undoubtedly, I probably caused uh, some people, some employers or employees, some families to, because of the financial things we were doing, kept them from health care. Um, I pray and hope that no one died because of that activity, uh, but that that was the standard way that uh, carriers did and do business. And uh, I finally made a decision that I was gonna go back into my, my marketplace that I spent most of my career in. And uh, I'm going to try to undo some of the things that I did and uh, bring some advantage uh, to employers rather than disadvantage. So if I understood you correctly, and you could, so you could be comfortably retired, 
as you mentioned, you're active, but you could be, you could be uh, RVing across the nation. You could be fishing. Uh, you could be doing a large host of things. And because of this weight on your shoulders from your career, uh, you've made a conscious decision to actually go back into work from my understanding, full-time or close to full-time. Um, and so I think we're fascinated to hear why. And that's really the point of this uh, discussion today. Well, I think the time's going to fly and we always seem to run out of time. But let's talk about some of those things that caused you to unretire from Abuka. I, I, I do want to talk uh, specific, specifically about some behaviors that as I can look back now uh, at my time there, um, that um, for me personally, um, the more I understand uh, about the the incentives and the objectives uh, of the large carriers, the, there's at least in my mind, there's uh, even a question of morality uh, and integrity. And um, I'm going to share some of those things today uh, to to help you better understand what I mean by that. I, I can start out by talking one of, about one of my favorite subjects of that time and probably where I had the most negative impact and that was on a a company-wide strategy called marketing intervention and uh, I'm going to start out saying that every carrier has a similar strategy if you're a broker and you're on this call and you the carrier you know what I'm talking about particularly as I get into some examples Hey, Terry, um, it's starting to mm -hmm. jump a little bit. Can you maybe shut off your video just for a second so it maybe saves it from cutting off? Just to, Terry and I had talked, so we're going to let him know when it's doing that. And we'll yeah, it, maybe and, another minute or two bounce back. And and I apologize. Can you hear me now, Matt? I think so. I think it's good. Okay. Again, uh, my connection in the desert isn't quite as good as I thought it would be. Um, so at any rate, I, I, I want to talk about the the strategy of, mar of what my carrier called marketing intervention. Every other BUCA has a similar strategy, maybe by a different name. But in my position as a regional leader in uh, the northern part of the state, I had the authority to intervene on underwritten rates for any given employer. And that, would, that was in new business as well as renewal business. So the, the basic concept behind that was that as the regional leader, I had a better understanding of the marketplace and the competitiveness of the market than underwriting did. So I was given leeway to, to manipulate rates, again, both new and renewal. Um, but I will tell you that that intervention was driven by other things like broker politics, favoritism, and particularly greed. And I'll give you an example of that. And uh, this is a true life example. Uh, but at one point, I gave a local beer distributor a 30% renewal decrease because I liked their brand. And the broker was a former colleague at my other carrier. Uh, even though the that, that renewal originally was very competitive, I lowered the rate anyway, 30%, because I could. And, and I had that power to manipulate uh, rates and the marketplace. Um, by and large, brokers with the largest books of business received the best interventions, and they weren't always rate decreases. There was, there was a tactic that I've heard David Contorno refer to uh, as the kabuki dance. Um, often, uh, the process was we always sent the renewal rate out to the broker before we delivered it uh, to the employer. And often I would get a call from a broker uh, and asking me on a particular uh, rate, renewal, a renewal rate, uh, to actually increase the rate. Maybe it was a 10% rate renewal and he would call me and say, bump that up to 5%. And then he would take that out to the employer and while the employer was, you know, pretty dissatisfied and not very happy about it, the broker would then promise to go back to the carrier 
and, quote, negotiate, end quote, a better rate. Um, in hindsight, by the way, that for me, that was the only value that I could see that the broker brought to the customer, and it was a false value. Um, so um, I also played, I'll call them, I played tricks on brokers as well. I may have given them an already inflated rate increase when I sent it out to the broker. And then the broker would ask me to even bump it up more. And then he'd go out and do his kabuki dance with his customer. Um, and then he would come back and ask me to um, reduce the rate. And then I would actually negotiate with him and tell him, well, if, if you want me to reduce it, uh, I, I'll, you know, I'll need a half a point of your commission back in order to do that. And in fact, I could lower it a couple points if you gave me that half a point back. Um, so I was playing both ends. I was playing the employers uh, as well as um, the brokers. Um, and and that, that was a common practice, by the way. <clears throat> I also had, uh, we talk about politics and favoritism. Um, I, I had a, a couple of brokers um, under my watch who happened to have personal relationships with my boss. And if they weren't, if the negotiations with them between me and them wasn't going the way they wanted to, they never hesitated to send my boss an email of which then created an email from my boss to me basically saying, give them what they want. Um, so again, favoritism and politics played through the whole thing. Um, well, and, and I don't, I want to interrupt your thought, but what would be the motivation? So you're saying that, right. The, the, the broker often traditionally is taking a good guy side with the employers. I'll go get you 5% off. I'll go get you more off. Um, what is the theme? What is the ultimate goal of the, of the uh, insurance carrier and the producer here? And what's the with them? If you've heard that phrase, what's in it for me, what's the with them for the broker to actually, have the high, is there a with them to have the high, a higher amount of increase? When a broker is dealing with a carrier, um, certainly in a, in a fully insured scenario, but also in a self-funded scenario, um, what's in it for them is because the broker has no ability to provide any any positive input on cost or quality of the health plan for the employer, the typically the only way they could show value is this ability to go to um, strong arm the carrier into reducing the rate. This uh, this form of almost pseudo negotiation, but what I'm hearing is that maybe it wasn't so much as it appears to the employer on both fully insured and self funded plans. No, it never was. Um, rarely was there any transparency in that process. So you had mentioned this is kind of the, the norm, I guess. What uh, it, my first thought when you mentioned that would be this, because, you know, there's always a right in any profession. There's always those who kind of play, who like to do things under the table or don't play fair. Um, what are we talking here? 10 percent of brokers, 20 percent. I mean, what? 50%, what are we what are we talking in terms of brokers who maybe in along with yourself and right, which is why you're working again and unretired, but what what do we how much is of this is the exception or how what do employers need to know on this? Um virtually every broker I worked with, um, maybe not on every one of the renewals, but every broker I worked with participated in this process. Partly um um, because yeah, I'll, I'll give them a little due here, partly because they didn't have any choice. Carrier controls. Um, and, and again, in, when you're dealing with a carrier, a broker has little or no ability to impact cost and quality. Right. So when you say, when you say that, what do you mean? What, how is the broker, how is the broker tied to the carrier and, and limited Right. So there's there's one side where they're actually potentially negotiating the highest rate possible for a 
uh, increased commission. They get a percentage of claims, right? If, if their compensation has not yet been aligned, by the way, uh, note to all employers, if your compensation does not align with your broker, if they're getting rewarded when your plan unravels or gets worse, uh, note to change that, to see the contracts, to see the claims, to get all of that arranged. The laws are now in your support, eliminating gag clauses and so forth. Um, but tell us more about that, Terry. Um, as far as uh, the, the broker's ability to, to change that, so you were mentioning kind of that they were like a slave to the carrier. What what does that mean? Well, I, I can give you um, an example. Um, and I know there's a number of brokers slash advisors on here. And I would I would warn you that if you're heavily involved with providing buca plans, um, you're unwittingly becoming a slave to the to the bukas i understand i was there you're, you're paid well if you're just doing buka business it's easier than actually uh, providing advice and and getting into the analytics uh, you're bonused extremely well uh, and all of that is because you conform to the carrier's goals and um, you may not know it uh, or you may not totally understand the depth of it but you, in fact, are required to conform to the carrier's goals, not your employer clients. And, and the, the, the risk of that is, um, if you go back and look at your contract, and it's with every BUCA, you're going to find that more than likely in your contract with the BUCA, they have the ability to terminate your contract without clause at any time, wiping away years of work and income. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. Uh, uh, the, one of the largest, if not the largest brokerage agency, which was multi-state, I think they actually took in 50 states. I was only with mine. But I, uh, I cut their contract. I, uh, I took their contract away from them. And it was uh, incredibly expensive for them. They had a very large block of business with us. Um, but I did it. Uh, I for the the reason I did it was I found they also owned their own TPA and replacing all of their better business with their own TPA and placing all of their riskier business with the, the Buka that I worked for. Um, took a year investigation in, in, in what they were doing and uh, I had enough proof, so uh, I removed their contract. And then for a few years after that. I use that example to basically keep other brokers in line and, and to make sure that they were conformed to our goals first. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a scary thought. If you're a broker out there, it, it does take a crisis of conscience. Uh, and that's where I am today. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, but it does take that crisis of conscience and a lot of courage to change your direction and point yourself more towards the interest of your client rather than the interest of the carrier. But I'm telling you, you're here because you know transparency is coming. So I'm I'm asking you to make the, that change before the change is made for you. So on one hand, we have a case where the jo the jokingly uh, the jokingly phrase uh, kabuki dance. I don't usually use that term, but I I can get it and understand it, uh, where it looks like there's a negotiations uh, between the broker and the, and the carrier. And uh, it looks as if the, the broker is doing their best for the employer and so forth. It's all maybe more of a game than it appears uh, as both are rewarded when the claim, when the, when the cost goes up for the employer. On the other side, I've actually had a call from at least one that I recall uh, advisor who shared this with me. So this undue pressure, this silent hidden background pressure that you mentioned that if you start changing your accounts to independent TPAs or essentially away from that specific VUCA, uh, they'll have a threat. Maybe you've got, right? Maybe you've got a mix of, of independents and VUCAs. 5, 10, 20 accounts or something that they would threaten. In fact, you had mentioned you did it, so it happens. And then you wanted everyone to know about it, that they would cut off all your VUCA accounts or cut off all that specific BAU or CAA account and say, here's 
we mean business. You either do business with us or we're going to make your life really bad. Is that fair? Yeah, it's definitely fair. It may not have been that direct, but everyone understood what that message was. Um, and uh, there, there's another thing that that I think I, well, I certainly experienced where um, the other side of that is if you're a buka broker and you're primarily a buka broker, uh, then you're probably pretty well at juggling all of the bukas in your marketplace at the same time and uh, working to appease them all. Um, so uh, you're going to, you know, employers, for the most part, uh, the market is not growing. So what the bukas have to do is steal from each other. Mm -hmm. um, and they certainly appreciate it when the broker helps them do that. So there's that aspect. I do want to give you one other quick example, though. So we're talking about on an individual basis how this process impacted individual employers. But I want to give you a, a, a larger, more broadened view of this. And I use the example that uh, one month I intervened on 45 renewals. 35 were given rate decreases. I gave the other 10 uh, renewals, rate increases that made up for 99% of what I gave away to the other 35. Now, if you can't, without a great deal of explanation, if you can't understand how unfair that was, um, I, th I think you got to pay better attention to it. So the employers who are having bad years were compensated uh, in the big pool of money by employers that were having good years. Um, so can we discern a little bit? I think probably most of the audience is probably in the self-funded side. So if we could just clear, maybe if we could clarify some of those things, Terry. So I guess a couple of questions. Uh, one is, can we talk a bit about uh, broker compensation and that what would be the rewards? Um, it appears to me that there are some pretty lucrative awards for brokers to push commissioned items, which, right, there's this this tension between this conflict of interest. Are you representing the employer or are you a producer, as they're called in the industry? And the forward-thinking ones try to eliminate all those conflicts and and essentially gravitate away from the bukas, right? But uh, tell us, uh, what would be the incentive? So our, uh, the things we've discussed so far, and uh, in terms of the self-funded side, um, are there games? Tell us about some of the games there. Are they the same? Are they similar? Uh, we're talking about things like the ASO, the stop loss, et cetera. Can you tell us how that works? Yeah, you know, it, uh, again, from, from my experience, there's uh, a number of different avenues to uh, create revenue if you're a broker, particularly on a self-funded case with a carrier. Um, you, you, It was not uncommon to see a broker charging a per employee per month fee that we added to the admin fee. Um, also receiving uh, commissions off of the stop loss. And I will tell you very rarely did I ever know of an employer who knew about those commissions. Um, some of the larger houses have the ability to add a actual per script fee to the PBM. Where they're being paid three, four, five dollars on every script that that group has, that typically goes uh, unnoticed as well. So there's there's uh, plenty of creative ways to create even more revenue on the self-funded, I think, than there was on the fully insured. What would you say, Terry? Like, say, a five or ten year person of a, a successful broker, what would you say that their typical income is? And also, if you could talk about even vacation trips and things like that. Oh, yeah. Well, let's certainly talk about that. I I, uh, I took brokers all over the world on company trips. Ireland, Hawaii, uh, the Caribbean, um, lots in California and Florida and golf trips, um, um, skyboxes to professional sports, basketball, baseball, even football. Um, I remember uh, hosting a number of brokers at a skybox for a professional basketball game. Um, and uh, the skybox, of course, is uh, 
pretty pretty extravagant and uh, uh, all the food that you wanted and uh, at some point they brought the dessert cart around and then all of the guests go out in the hallway and choose their their dessert um, at the uh, end of that process then I'm given a bill for that and the dessert cart uh, I, I can recall at one time was uh, $2,400 um, just for that. So the amount of money that that carriers throw that are not direct income is definitely a factor as well. So you were you were really working with these brokers directly. In fact, right, part of your role was to develop their compensation packages aside from what they're charging the employer directly. So they're charging the employer, then they're getting these payments from the other side, from the carrier mm -hmm. side. Any idea what their gross salaries are for someone who's successful in the market on some sort of average? I mean, I don't know if that's a fair question. Yeah, I, in, in today's age, I would think if you're a primarily a Buka broker and you have a, um, a you know, a, we won't say sizable, a good side, side size of business um, under you yeah you're, you're certainly um, usually over well over a hundred thousand um, dollars and then if I look at my experience you could probably add another 10 to 25 thousand in um, not not direct cash type of income the trips and the golfing and the sporting things and all of that okay. And then the ones who are especially successful would probably be just like any profession, I guess, right? I know, and I don't think anyone's against anyone making a fair income. What we're talking about here is just the uh, the transparency of who you're working for and who and how much you're getting paid. And thank, thankfully, we can uh, here in the second we can shift to what can employers do to make sure they're they're working with trustworthy partners. I give you my uh, yeah, I can give you my personal example of that. Sure. The first thing I decided when I decided I wanted to go back and start consulting and advising with employers was uh, I decided that uh, my income was going to be completely and totally transparent. So uh, my income structure is based off a, a, a direct monthly uh, consulting fee, uh, typically based on the size of the employer. And in my consulting contract, I actually guarantee that I will not receive any income of any sort in any way on, on that particular employer, except for what that employer pays me directly. Um, I highly recommend if you're, if you're a broker today that you consider that model. If you really want to be the advocate of your employer, start working for your employer and stop working for the, the carrier. We're seeing a shift where um, the, the most advanced employers are taking a mindset. There may be still some top level stop loss needed, but to, to go in the angle of purchasing healthcare, which is more direct relationship, right? Really what we're purchasing than purchasing insurance. The industry has done a magnificent job of uh, creating the mindset. I need to purchase insurance that somehow insurance equals healthcare. And many, of course, thought leaders in the space have clarified those are two very distinct things. So that's one of the shifts one of the shifts for an employer. I mean, one of the things I've noticed in stop loss quoting. So in self-fund health, we have a health plan and we can help with these things. We're very flexible on kind of the best deal and the best options and so forth. Uh, but in my experience, stop loss, uh, we can send a form, we can get census data or claims data. And it seems to be a couple of hours, maybe depending on the case, could be more, could be less. Um, but then we're talking about, I've even heard as much as that self-funded employers, the, the advisors there can name their stop loss percentage that the stop loss insurance companies are at their mercy almost as in, hey, I won't sell your product. And the typical seems to be around 10 to 15%, but I've done calculations. If, you're, if your stop loss is a million dollars and you get a 15%, well, that's, that's a pretty quick 150 grand for an hour or two of work um, is my, my experience. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, first of all, I'm not opposed to that, and I probably sound like I am. What I am opposed to is not being completely transparent with the employer. Yeah, if if you make 150 thousand off the stop loss of a self-funded group, um, and the employer knows that, 
then he can judge, um, you know, your value. Um, and you shouldn't be ashamed of your value. If you're worth $150,000, let the employer know and uh, uh, move forward with that. I, I want to say something about fully insured and self-funded. And um, this is kind of uh, came to me after I left the, uh, the carrier. Um, there really is no difference on how rates are developed whether it's fully insured or self-funded. Now I'm talking about the rate development and, and the expense of a health plan. The fact of the matter is, if you're fully insured, um, particularly you know with a, a BUCA, the process that they take to, to, to determine your rates is the exact same process that they use with self-funding. There is no difference. So when you're fully insured, you really are self-funded. Uh, all the carrier does is, uh, with their actuarial expertise, they determine what your claim spend is going to be for the next 12 months. And they build that into your rate along with their admin fees. And then they purchase stop loss on you as well, either in the form of creating their own pooling. Uh, my carrier most often bought stop loss on their fully insured book of business from Lloyd's of London. So the carriers, you know, you think you're fully insured and that puts the carrier at risk. The, the carrier really never is at risk. I'll give you another example. In 10 years of, of the uh, self-funded groups that I did, uh, when we always, you know, everybody uh, typically uh, wants to have specific stop loss um, most groups then want to have an aggregate to protect, um, you know, the the over the umbrella part of it. <clears throat> we required all groups under probably a thousand lives to purchase aggregate coverage, and in ten years, I never paid an aggregate claim. Um, so that that ended up being total profit to the carrier. So it's very rare. So if the actuaries are doing their job well. And that the, if the aggregate's never being reached, is that fair? It, it, actually, if the aggregate's reached, then it was a failure of underwriting. Okay. Yeah. Can we talk about MLR a second? So uh, the ACA, specifically what was titled the Affordable Care Act, which hasn't been so affordable, uh, it was probably more accessible care act, would have been a better title for that. Often we see bills uh, that are often labeled uh, very interestingly today. Uh, but one of the things, now MLR was a thing before then, uh, but with the Affordable Care Act, the medical loss ratio, which is a simple division between uh, total cost, right, and total claims, and um, it's often used as a way to increase rates. So what's interesting is, according to the ACA, then um, the law says that carriers, uh, even this is even relevant, directly relevant to self-funded plans, uh, can keep, right, 15% of uh, the premiums and what was it, 10 or 20% for small employers, 15% for bigger employers. So what's interesting then is it creates this perverse incentive, as many call it, right? We know the sellers of the direct sellers of healthcare hospitals, every seller, every store wants the prices to be higher, they make more. What we maybe didn't realize is that the next two entities in the complex of the industrial healthcare complex, the carriers, right? 15% of a, of a bigger number is, is more than 15% of a smaller number. So they want to go into their boardroom and say they had a revenue increase. They actually want the claims to go up. The two people sitting at the table, the, the, the sellers of healthcare, the hospitals and others, and, and the carriers actually want the cost to go up. The employer, who is the payer, the only payer, the, the insurance is in the middle is the reimburser is a correct title for that, uh, aren't even at the table. And then the producer, as they're called in the industry, the traditional ones, now there are good ones out there and there are more and more uh, but they also, they're getting a, a percentage of the claims. So we have all three entities on that side want the claims to go up. And the employers, and this is very complicated game. I spent 25 years in HR. I didn't understand it. I listened to my broker. And uh, about two-thirds of the way through my career, I realized that was a big mistake, that I needed to be savvy on these things. Could you talk about ML, MLR, Terry? And you shared something with me about six months ago that sometimes even that number has changed a little bit. Can you talk about that or anything else on that topic that you'd like? Yeah, 
Um, and and you, you really hit a, a strong point there that um, how carriers make more money is by increasing claims. Um, so that that's a big driver. But the first thing um, the audience needs to understand is that it was the big carriers who had the most impact on the ultimate de uh, definitions and requirements of the MLR rule during the ACA negotiations. The other interesting thing that I always find about that is it's called the Affordable Care Act, but the affordability part of the act was actually negotiated away and the focus was on accessibility. Um, but uh, I can give you an example of uh, what's called intercompany elimination. It's a, it's a cute little accounting sleight of, sleight of hand maneuver um, that, that carriers can do that keeps them within that 15% um, area so that they're in compliance with the MLR. Um, I I'm currently working with an employer that has approximately 100 employees um, and they are, they're coming off of a, a large carrier renewal. <clears throat> Last year, uh, their claims included a 1.3 million in medical claims and 800,000 in pharmacy claims for a total of 2.1 million in claims. Now, their annual premium for that year was 1.8 million. So it appears they had 117% loss ratio. But what happens when a carrier owns the PBM, which we know all large carriers own uh, the PBM? Um, what happens is they get to move, they get to count the, the RX expense as claims. But what they don't have to account for, in this case, we were able to uh, discover that the PBM had made $500,000 uh, off, of, off of this group by collecting undisclosed rebates and spread pricing and manufacturer bonus. Uh, but because they could make it look like a financial loss, it's still to the employer, you know, to ACA, look like 117% loss ratio. Uh, they felt justified by giving the group a double digit renewal increase. And if you account for the profit profitability that the PBM had, they were actually less than 100% loss ratio and should have gotten at least a, a pass or a renewal decrease. Um, so that's that's an example of so the producer, play with the MLR. So the producer goes to the employer and say you had a bad year and when bad years happen, um, the costs are going to go up notably, right? Quoting the MLR, 117%. But if you account for really the vertical integration, the ownership of the PBM, the carrier actually made good money there, but was acting as if they didn't. And uh, are there any other... Uh, cases where MLR is, is potentially manipulated? Um, well, certainly in, in the claims cost itself, um, the carrier I worked for uh, had a, uh, a creative way of accounting for a claim. Um, they called it the average discount percentage. So they published... Uh, they looked at all of the hospital contracts and, and provider con, uh, contracts, and they would uh, take all of that experience actuarially and then determine um, for a specific geographic area of the state what was the average discount percentage. And that's what they illustrated as the value of their PPO. Um, so, and by the way, they, they individually contracted with every provider in that geographic area. Uh, so there was no commonality. They weren't even, uh, they weren't even always contracted the same way. Some of them were based on, um, uh, inpatient per diems. Uh, none, none of them or very few of them were actually a contract based off of, uh, a bill charge discount. Um, so, so they played with that. So it, even to the point where if you were self-funded and um, 
someone had a hospital stay and that EOB would reflect exactly what that average discount was instead of what was the real negotiated rate between the carrier and the hospital. Um, so probably a good, a, a good reason to know your ASO agreement um, that you're gonna recommend for your client to sign. But the point there was self-employers really didn't have any insight on what the real claims cost were. Um, but you can assume that that strategy was not built uh, to provide an advantage to the employer. Uh, it was certainly built to provide the advantage to the carrier. A couple of questions, and we, well, I guess one question quick, and then we can jump into solutions and questions as well here. Um, but uh, you were with, so you mentioned you were with Buka at least your 40 plus year career, 20 years. Did you notice, and this, this is, I have not talked to you about this and many of these things, um, but over this 20 year time, right, we talked about this notion of rigging institutions of trust or or maybe, you know, depending organizations losing their way, even nonprofit entities, right? The, the cultures within, new CEOs, pressures to Wall Street, et cetera. Did you notice anything uh, in that 20 years or just in your time in the industry of how you started, maybe, you know, it's kind of speaking of the ethics, if you will, or the practices to the time you retired, was there a shift there? Is that accurate to say, or, or was it pretty much the same in the 20 so years? I, I worked for the largest not-for-profit slash member-owned health carrier in the United States. Um, a little different than most of the other for-profit Bukas. But I can tell you, at least in my experience, uh, they operated as if they were for profit. I'll, I'll give you a kind of an anecdotal example of that. I distinctly remember the first year that we hit a hundred a billion dollars in profit. And it required an entire communication strategy from our PR uh, department because they knew when that was made public that uh, certainly the media and uh, some other institutions were going to question why is a not-for-profit company uh, generating a billion dollars in profit? And then maybe even more uh, importantly, what were they doing? So in, uh, an entire we'd actually get instructions, we as leaders, regional leaders, because we knew that the local media was going to come to us. We were giving talking points and things uh, about, uh, well, it only equaled two months of all of our claims um, and other other excuses of why it was okay to do that. And of course, the, you know, the real point of that is if you're a not-for-profit, I'm happy that you profited a billion dollars Question is, what are you doing with that? Are you reinvesting it back into your membership that actually owns you or not? And I can tell you for the most part, my employer uh, basically sat on that, uh, piled up reserves or uh, more reserves. At one time they were being questioned about, um, they were so far over the regulatory requirement for re reserves that uh, uh, they were receiving some heat for that. Um, but yeah, that, you know, that's from the not-for-profit standpoint, um, that always kind of caught me a little off guard. It, but maybe a good example of how that bothered me was our chairman of the board at that time, um, that particular year, he made five and a half million dollars as being the chairman of the board. Now, typically, a chairman of a board of a carrier has two meetings a month or whatever. Uh, that is not typically a full-time job. Cigna's chairman of the board is around 550000 as a comparison uh, for his, his um, stipend or his salary for that, where here we are not-for-profit, and our chairman's making... Uh, you know, five and a half million the following year it went up to nine and a half million. Um, that year, also, the top 10 officers in, in the C suite um, collectively were given a little over 55% in raises 
um, which was uh, almost immeasurable compared to what the rest of the uh, the employees of the company received for raises that year too. So um, a lot of questions there that 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 bothered me. So and I don't know that there's how do you resolve that and how do you answer that and um, the way I'm doing it is uh, making sure that my clients um, aren't their customers. Yeah, as we say, don't feed the beast, and the beast is loosely defined, but certainly the the Bukas have earned their reputation there, and I I haven't found a way to win there to get a fair shake. Now that wasn't the case thirty years ago. That's kind of these former institutions of trust. It's important that we look at those today. But I can see the weight on your shoulders as you went into retirement and try to do try to do right with others to follow the golden rule, right? Treat others as you want to be treated, and. And, um, you know, what's what bothers me the most, I've always I was I was bullied as a child, which many probably don't realize because I'm six, five and two fifty and even studied martial arts. But I was small and scrawny and quiet and I was bullied pretty much my whole childhood. I'm not sure why. But what it did is it ingrained this passion in me to stand up for others and those who are being uh, abused or oppressed or picked on. I will jump in right away. <laughs> if you've ever seen me in a store or a ball game or something, I will be polite. But I will. And that's why we're foster parents as well. But I see, you know, where is this money coming from? This money is coming. The only payer of commercial health care is the employer and the employees. And I just I just look at all these people in 25 years and mostly manufacturing these people. If they're one, you know, they have to can't be a minute late. The line starts at 6 a.m. It ends at 2 p.m. or three shifts around the clock. They're working their tails off and they're barely getting by. And a lot of this money is coming from them. They're powerless. They're voiceless in this thing. They come into the enrollment meetings. Um, employers, they really need you to watch these things and to begin to represent them. If you knew, if your employer was buying groceries for you and you and you found out they were paying $100 for a gallon of milk and 120 for a dozen of eggs, uh, you'd probably be pretty upset that they weren't shopping very wisely. And so it's really important that we start to dig in. And so, Terry, uh, as we kind of come to the uh, toward the end here, uh, I think we could talk for like all day on this topic. It's fascinating to me. Um, but what are some things? And certainly there's a whole right. There's lawyers out there and things, but maybe in you know, kind of in a sense of the short version, what are some things employers should be doing right now and can be doing to prevent these these deceptions and, and being played like a fiddle, if you will? Yeah, I, it, it, I'm. I'll use that kind of for my closing thoughts too. But first and foremost, if you're an employer and your your advisor, your broker doesn't help you achieve full transparency into the cost and quality of your health plan, get a new one. There are plenty of us out there now who are actually working to create that transparency and to show real value. But you know, as I reflect back, particularly on what I call that kabuki dance. I wonder if it ever occurred to the employers that their pricing should be based on their underwriting risk and nothing else. That's a fair way of doing business. So, you know, did if they got a rate reduction, um, did, did they ever question why they were given a higher rate to begin with? Um, and, and I think about that and, and the part that I probably can't see as well as being on the other side of the fence, the answer is that's the way the game was played for so many years. So they, you know, they didn't know uh, and probably didn't understand uh, that that wasn't uh, a fair way of doing things. So I, I would say to the advisors on the call today that we really have a responsibility to help employers understand all of these games within the industry and that they're playing with their money. And it, it'll take all of us to point out the lack of integrity in that process. The other thought um, that I have actually come from uh, Wendell Potter, who I've had a couple of occasions to share the, the, the podium with. And one thing that he said that just resonates with me is that we have to understand that the employer is not the customer of the big carriers. The real customer is first the financial analysts on Wall Street uh, who impact the company value, and second, the, the shareholders, stockholders of, of the carrier who expect hefty returns. 
The employer is nothing more than a tool that creates revenue to satisfy the real customer. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And the larger the customer grows, the more sophisticated they become at milking the employer. Interesting. I can speak, you know, as an HR person, uh, the first two thirds of my career, I didn't understand any of this. I'd been around it and I thought I understood. Uh, but I can tell you, it is really difficult. And even today, as I watch, you know, the bigs now, I know good individuals and I'm not say good or bad, but I know individuals who have this conscience, who want to do what's right, even within these large organizations, these large brokerages, Uh, that seem to be even get sued once in a while and have this huge settlement and it quietly goes away. And then they get sued for these kind of major ethical issues and then it quietly goes away. And so is there going to be a, a tipping point? Um, but one of the things I've noticed is, so it's almost more individual based than organizational. And there's even pressure on the individuals within. Uh, so this is a really uh, kind of a stronghold here. I've seen, but I've seen employers switch from one brokerage firm to the next and really they're told they're on a total transparency plan or they're told these things and this is, we're not collecting any commissions. I've watched brokers lie to, to employers' faces when I knew they were getting stop loss commissions and vacations and other things. And they said that they didn't know I Right. I'm all for, if you're, if you're making good money and you're worth it, go for it. I'm all for that. I'm, if you know me, I'm a capitalist. I'm a supporter, supporter of the free market. I'm a supporter of profitability in the American dream. I'm not. I'm not a fan of of single payer healthcare. I I have trust issues on that side as well. Who do you trust, right? Kind of an animal farm. If you haven't read that book by George Orwell, right? Who do you trust? You go from one to the next. How can an employer, though, if they want to, if they want to choose to have an advisor or broker, how can they? Any tricks there of the trade? How do they know if the next one's good? Because I see many being fooled. I see many being fooled with hugs and smiles and lunches. And they think they've made a good change and they're right back and it's just a, a same problem, different person. Any thoughts yeah. on that as we kind of near the end here? Yeah, we didn't really get into the CAA very much, but you know, there's now uh, federal legislation that that helps the employer by requiring, uh, if they ask, requiring their broker to fully disclose direct and non-direct income. And I, and I think back to the Osceola, Os, Osceola School District in Florida uh, and Gallagher, um, if you're not aware of that, uh, Gallagher, it was Gallagher's client and they signed a contract for uh, a fee to service it. And then they, behind the scenes, they were collecting uh, income from the PBM and they got caught. Uh, unfortunately, rather than it going all the way through the court system to create precedent, Gallagher got the school district to settle out of court. Um, but the, the, to answer your question, uh, use that that legislation to require your broker or your advisor to report all of the income. Um, it may not be foolproof, um, but at least it's a start. And uh, think about uh, who should pay your broker. If you're the employer, should you let the carrier pay the broker through commissions? Or should you allow that broker or advisor uh, to, to uh, enter into an agreement with you that you will pay them directly? And then you will always know their value. Um, you also have to get them to contractually guarantee not to collect income from any other source while they're servicing your account. Great points. You know, I think compensation alignment is key. And I've seen maybe, right, you want to trust who you're working with, that they seem very trustworthy. I would really would suggest that in writing it. They should be disclosing it anyway. Uh, but I have a form if anyone wants. It's a very detailed form. Require them to fill it out in writing. I've seen uh, those things dismissed with a few comments and then I, and I knew otherwise. And so again, uh, supportive of all though, of all who are doing well and, and self-funded plans are very different. Uh, it requires managing the plan, it requires building the partners and actually looking to purchase healthcare would be ideal. Uh, but just be careful of those quick comments. Yeah, we're doing everything right, right. We've named our plan total transparency or all sorts of similar ones to that. Uh, in most cases, I found, unfortunately, they're not. And almost the bigger the bigger it is, maybe the more you should be skeptical that the smaller ones coming out that are truly transparent and really uh, have your same goals in mind are 
often a better option. Uh, so uh, uh, as many of you know, certainly I've written a book called Don't Feed the Beast. Uh, it's only the second book of its kind. The first was written by John Torinas in the early, uh, early to mid 2000s, uh, where he had kind of started this movement. We jokingly call him the grandfather uh, he's like 87 or 88 today, I think. And he's going to be at our conference. So we're having a big conference, a limited attendance. I think it's going to fill up fast. It'll be announced soon in terms of the registration, August 27th, uh, 28th and 29th, rather, sorry. Terry and Wendell Potter will be speaking at that conference. There's the book. Terry's got some copies. A great tool for forward-thinking advisors to hand out as well in terms of uh, helping educate on this very complex topic. And Wendell Potter, if you know him, he is uh, similar to Terry in that he worked for the Bukas most of his career. And he jokingly wrote a book as well, uh, but he calls himself the chief propaganda officer. And that's really what he was paid to do. So it comes back to uh, institutions of trust. And as I uh, have a whole chapter in the book on trustworthy partners and really just uh, not taking a quick answer, making and put it in writing. And just when you know you have, right, as, as, as an employer, a former employer, who's built a plan and had great success. It wasn't perfect, but we we built a model that's now repeatable as, as many others around the nation have as well that's very similar, uh, but it's certainly not the norm yet. It's the, it's the strong exception. You cannot, if you have five players on a basketball team and you can only trust two of them, you're never, the other three maybe don't want you to win, you're never gonna win. You've got to know that they have your motives in mind and that they are doing things, especially on the compensation, kind of aligns behavior. And so make sure the compensation's right, the behavior will follow. So I want to thank Terry. Terry, could you share a little bit about just your specific business today and what you're doing and anything else you'd like to share as we close? So I created a, a consulting firm called Primum Risk Strategies, and everybody says premium, but it's Primum. It's a Greek derivative, meaning first. Um, a little over a year ago, uh, I took on a partner um, who is uh, somewhat in the same boat that I am, although he comes from the hospital slash clinic slash health system side. He's former chief operating officer of the largest uh, hospital health system in our marketplace. Um, so we 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 tout our value as uh, based on what I know of the carrier industry. And what he knows of the hospital and clinic industry, uh, we can help employers avoid all of those pitfalls that are never made transparent to, to them to begin with. So um, that's what that's what we're doing now. Yeah, and thank you for doing that. And more power to you and coming out of retirement. And by the way, if you can reach out to either of us, and always glad to help. Um, I am uh, right now. I've turned this right this. This strategy that I developed from scratch and that um, has been proven now into a health plan. Uh, so I am not an advisor. I am not a broker. Uh, we are a health plan and we work with advisors. So if you're a forward thinking advisor and want to work with us, let us know. Terry, how uh, can they reach you if they want to contact you? Uh, you can find me uh, at my website, firmumriskstrategies.com. Uh, or you can find me on LinkedIn are the two easiest places uh, to reach out to me. Gotcha. Yeah, I want to thank you, Terry, for taking the time today and certainly look forward to your talk at the end of August as we uh, as we approach that first annual uh, Don't Feed the Beast conference. And uh, I've been busy with the book uh, spreading across the nation, speaking and actually now scheduled for uh, uh, tw uh, 10 different, 12 different states in 10 months. And so getting the uh, sharing the good news of employer solutions for healthcare. And I am on LinkedIn as well, or Matt at selffundhealth.com. So I want to thank everybody for your time today. Um, may the movement keep moving. And, um, and thanks again, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone.